But I'll get started just by kind of telling you guys where I came from a little bit, um, kind of get into the downward spiral, as I'm sure you're excited to hear about, and uh, then get back on top, if you will. Uh, I grew up in Fairport, uh, as Robert mentioned, uh, steady home, two parents, two sisters, loved me, had everything I needed, um, you know, was pretty successful going through school, I played sports, um, and I think that is one piece that kind of attributed to my downfall was being so involved in athletics, you kind of are taught this toughness and uh, you have to be so mentally tough and, and strong and uh, I kind of got away or never even started being a vulnerable person and being open and, and just kind of had to hold everything inside and, and I'll touch back on that later but I think that started uh, through playing basketball and, and being successful in that and spending all my time with that. Uh, but going through middle school and high school, um, I wasn't myself ever, I don't think. I think I just wanted to be who you guys would like. Uh, whoever I was talking to, I wanted to entertain them and be their best friend. So I never was sure of who I was. I was just whatever they wanted me to be. Um, and I didn't realize that until it was probably far too late. Uh, so kind of a bummer there. Uh, but that's kind of how it was if I wanted to hang out with kids who I thought were pretty cool smoking pot That's what I would do that day um, I, I got into drinking in high school because that's what everybody was doing. I had to do it I had to hang out with those kids um, but maintaining playing basketball I was able to have some sort of discipline I guess you could call it uh, Because my goals were there and I had aspirations of things I wanted to do and get to um, and I, and I kind of made it through high school with my head on my shoulders and, and was in a pretty good place. And then uh, some tragedy struck right before I graduated and we lost some friends. And, and when that happened, basketball didn't really matter to me anymore. You know, I was worried about when my next friend was gonna die. And that was kind of a tough place to be in. And I kind of lost, that was kind of the beginning of me losing my path a little bit. It wasn't that happened and I was in a bunch of trouble, you know. Um, but I stopped having goals and I stopped caring about things that I cared about and it made it easier for me to kind of slip down that slope and, and go out more and, and spend more time with people that weren't good for me. Um, and that kind of takes me into, into college a little bit where I began to experiment with just about everything and anything uh, and still was able to play basketball in college and graduate and do all that um, while kind of running myself into the ground. I got in trouble at my first college and uh, probably should have been a red flag there, but uh, one thing that was constant throughout my life was kind of an un uneducation on the entire addiction and opiate and all that world, um, where I was enabled a little bit because my family didn't really know what was going on and I was a, a master manipulator and could talk my way out of just about anything. Um, so instead of really getting help then, I transferred and went away and had another good three years. Um, the geographical cure worked for the time being, but I still never found who I was. So there was still kind of that emptiness inside where I'm still just doing what other people wanted me to do. And then that was the hardest part. Um, but going back a little bit, my first encounter with opiates was in high school, um, playing sports. I, I broke a couple ribs, uh, lacerated a couple organs, and I was in the ICU. And I'll never forget, they gave me this little green button to press and it administered morphine. And the first time I clicked that button, it's unexplainable. I think I was addicted right then and there. Uh, so a couple nights with that button, I would just sit there waiting for it to turn green so I could get my next dose. It was, it was pretty bad from the jump. Um, they prescribed me way too much as is a common theme here. Uh, and that was kind of my first encounter, but it didn't start there. Um, in college, I think I had three ankle surgeries in four years, a shoulder surgery, and every time, you know, it got a little bit more ingrained that I like this, this is good for me, this is what I need. Um, and it still really didn't take off, take off until uh, I got out of school. And then again, didn't really have a path. I didn't have a passion, I didn't have a goal, which again, made it easy to get lost and, and get into some trouble there. And I continued kind of down that road. I would start to take money from my family, take money from work. I would lie all the time, manipulate everybody. And I knew these things were wrong. Like I know right from wrong. I was raised from a good family. My parents did a great job. They might not think so, but I, I, I give them some credit. Um, but like, I, it was almost like I was outside of my body watching me do these terrible things to the people I cared about most. 
And, and for me, it was just like the lying and everything that like I couldn't not lie. I could be holding a can of Coke and tell you it was Mountain Dew. It's like you're looking at it, but I would convince you it was Mountain Dew somehow. Um, so the first time I tried to get, uh, get sober, I, again, was self-referred to go see Robert. And uh, the way I told my parents this time is I wrote him a long letter about how I was a piece of crap and I'm a terrible person, I'm a degenerate. And that was kind of what I thought addicts were at the time. You know, like I was beyond beat up about myself. Um, and, and that was one of the things that I struggled with a lot was the guilt and the shame because I shouldn't be this way. Nobody in my family is. How did I get here? I'm shaming all of them. I don't want anybody to know about this. It's an embarrassment. And I think that's one of the things that held me back. Um, and again, I'll touch on the uneducation thing. My mom and I sat down with Robert. We were like, yeah, no, it's cool to have a couple of drinks. I was never really an alcoholic. It was just the drugs I had to stop. Um, so hopefully Robert would have won that arm wrestling match, but it sounds like I got the better of him there. And, I had to come back for more to let him beat me that beat me down the second time. <laughs> um, so needless to say, I started to drink again after a couple months when I completed the first, didn't complete the first time. And uh, one thing led to another. I started smoking a little weed and, and down the slope you go. And uh, it got a lot worse. It got a lot worse. Um, stealing again, and doing all these terrible things. And I got in so deep that I thought the only way out was for me to die. And that was a tough realization. So I was sitting there, you know, I'd be stealing money and thinking, well, if I get caught this time, then, then I'll just have to kill myself. That was the only way out. I was in too deep. No one was ever going to forgive me again. And uh, the second letter this time around was uh, actually a suicide letter that I wrote. Um, it was uh, pretty hard to write, pretty hard for my family to read, um, but they kind of caught me kind of just in the nick of time, I guess, um, with some other people I cared about. And uh, I went to the psych ward, and that still wasn't enough because I had to have my drug dealer sneak into the psych ward. So they had, that was pretty bad. Um, but I got out, and uh, they referred me to an inpatient place, and uh, I was there for 18 days, and still I was going to complete there. But in my mind, I was, you know, 18 days sober. You know, I had some days in a row I should be thinking clearly my thought was to get out and use once more and then go see Robert for outpatient. So luckily I didn't get out. I went to another 30 day treatment down in Florida, which was an intensive 12 step uh, treatment facility. And that I think saved my life. Um, really introduced me to a lot of things and it really opened up my eyes as far as taking a look at myself, looking at who I wanna be. Like I didn't even know what my core values were. I said them, but I didn't live them. You know, I was, I was lost and it was a, it was a scary place, but it was an eye-opening experience and I learned a ridiculous amount about me, which was the first time in my life I was able to do any of that. Um, so it was, it was a really good experience down there. And again, that extra 30 days I think was a life changer for me because I was able to kind of get spiritually connected and, and work some of those steps that you hear a lot about. Um, and realized that I was the problem in a lot of these situations when I always like to blame other people. Um, so I'm, I'm much more aware of the people around me and who and how I'm affecting them rather than the world revolving around me and all you guys are getting in my way, um, which I think is making me a better person today. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, so I uh, ended up leaving that 30-day treatment um, and I spent three weeks with my sister in Kansas City. Still wasn't ready to come home yet. They had just moved there, and, uh, and that was an awesome time um, because obviously through those years of using, you know, the only person I wanted to see were drug dealers and, and people I could party with, you know? Like, I, my relationships have never been so bad. Um, but, the, you know, that started to, to grow quite a bit because, again, you're having real conversations for the first time. And, and deep conversations about how I feel and asking about how they feel and caring and listening. And, and those, those moments are gold to me because I missed out on so much time with them. And, uh, and I'm never more excited to see my family now when they were the last people I wanted to see just a couple years ago. Um, so that turnaround is amazing. After that, I got home with Robert and uh, started outpatient. I had it scheduled for the day I got back. Uh, I didn't want any time. And, uh, and that was a, a lifesaver. I think if I listened to everything Robert said the first time, we, I might have some more time under my belt than I do today. 
Um, but I, I owe quite a bit to him and everybody over there. And, and the groups for me were a great place to just kind of continue to work on the things that I needed to, was being open and sharing and talking to people who are of the similar thought process as me and in similar places. And, and that, I don't think you can really trade for anything. Um, so, you know, those were kind of the key steps for me and, and just kind of continuing that and continuing the education to everybody around me. Like, I'll, I'll never forget one of the first times I told a friend of mine that I was, you know, addicted to opiates. He was like, well, you're mentally tough. You, you're, you'll get through it. Like that, like, that was what he thought and he believed, you know, and, and that's what people don't understand. Um, you know, so the more people that come out, like you guys, uh, and maybe can spread the word a little bit, you know, how serious it is. Um, 